Um, I'm Tim Pletcher. I, uh, I was at uh, Cray for a little over two years. Um, uh, during that time, HPE acquired us. Uh, while I was at Cray, I was the software security architect for the Shasta systems. Um, there were a few of us that were systems architects there. Uh, and so um, my remit was the access control framework uh, that currently sits over the, uh, the Shasta systems. Um, I've since moved over to, uh, to the security engineering team at HPE, uh, and I work with Dan and a bunch of other folks in Sunil. Um, and I'm still involved with the HPC side of the house uh, in a few dimensions. I'd like to say that uh, while I'm here, um, there are a whole bunch of other folks that behind the scenes that worked um, on this particular dimension of the implementation. Uh, Zach Chrysler, Kevin Burns, a whole bunch of folks. So, uh, so not a one-man show by any stretch of the means over there. Um, I'd like to start off, talk a little bit about Shasta systems. So if you're not familiar with HPC, um, it's basically a giant liquid-cooled computer at its highest end. And uh, while they used to be vertically integrated machines, uh, they've evolved to be commodity compute resources that are basically pulled together by a blazingly fast network interconnect. And so you'll see that there is a lot of commodity in the compute nodes themselves. But for example, our secret sauce at Cray is the ASIC and the software that drives the network, along with a few other things in the programming environment and the kernel module optimizations on the compute nodes themselves for network. Uh, these machines are capable of, uh, of over an exaflop uh, of computational uh, activities. And I always like to write out the 10 to the 18th because it makes me think about how fast and how much uh, number, how fast and how many numbers these things are crunching at any one particular uh, time. Um, historically, these machines will scale to tens of thousands of compute nodes. Uh, and different installations will have different node counts uh, associated with them. Uh, right now, the, shat, the Slingshot network that, that runs Shasta systems uh, network-wise is 400 gig, um, going to 800 gig with the next uh, generation switches and cards that are coming down the road in a few years. And it's a Dragonfly network configuration, so it means that all of the nodes are never more than a fixed number of hops away from each other and allows for a highly uh, consistent and uh, manageable high-speed network. Um, there's truckloads of, of storage behind it. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, they just, they're just crazy, right? They're data center size computers. Uh, they consume power measured in megawatts. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and it's kind of funny when you think about it, because there are scenarios where the machines will have their own substation. Uh, or you have to be careful about when you run them, because they'll brown out the neighborhood, like the city. <laughs> so they're really neat machines. Um, so, uh, so one thing I would like to say about uh, uh, the uh, the Cray systems, and I guess I'll get to that. Our our management system, our system management model, basically um, is going to look fairly uh, uh, familiar to a lot of you uh, or all of you. Um, we basically have a user access uh, layer, and that deals with um, access into the compute plane itself, um, and that's provided either through the a container uh, instance that's running on the management plane itself, or via nodes that run off the the Kubernetes uh, management plane. Um, but still have access into the API plane to run administrative functions. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of functions around the compute nodes themselves. You need to manage the images. You need to manage boots. Uh, you need orchestration of boot, um, configuration management for the nodes themselves, and whatnot. Uh, then there's a the network management side. There's obviously two networks. One's the high-speed network, and one's the management network, which is a fairly standard uh, configuration. And so you've got all the interaction that goes on there. Um, Hardware management is, uh, is, as you would see, in a lot of uh, large data center op operations. Um, you've got to deal with power management. You've got to deal with all the uh, BMC endpoints, um, firmware, the whole nine yards. And then, of course, there's security. So uh, personas, uh, non-person entities all have to be accommodated in the authorization, authentication, and key management context. So how does that work? Um, the, the CSM software, the Cray Systems Managed Software, is, I would say, a fairly generic and vanilla um, CNCFE implementation. And that was by design. So we run on Kubernetes. We use Istio. Um, we have Vault. Uh, we have Cert Manager. Um, I think any of this, you know, you would take a look at it and be like, oh, yeah, of course, that makes perfect sense, right, if you're going to run an API plane in front of a, a big machine like this. 
Um, there's a whole bunch of different, if you look around the side there, there's a whole bunch of different networks that, that, uh, that are present in this system. Um, they deal with the hardware, they're VLAN basically, and they deal with the hardware management side to get to the BMCs. They deal with the API plane side to get to the services that need to run, and they deal with the customer facing side or the user facing side, um, whether that user facing side is for management or for high speed network access. And then we back it with uh, dedicated Ceph uh, hardware software. So <clears throat> along the way, um, <laughs> we, were, uh, we have a Gen 1, uh, uh, basically, when you think about the context of how um, you need to transit the API plane um, from a compute node, the, the side where you're going to have administrative traffic in and out is fairly straightforward. The, the harder part for us, because, and I say fairly straightforward, because our access control framework uh, basically is standalone. And so um, we ship Keycloak with this thing. You could basically stand the system up and run it completely in an air-gapped environment um, by itself without talking to anything else. And that was one of the original requirements, obviously, because of where these machines run. So, um, so our, our story around uh, basic API interaction as an individual is pretty straightforward and good. Um, we use OPA to deal with the OZ uh, topic, and Keycloak issues uh, standard OIDC tokens, and away you go. Um, where that breaks down is that there are applications that run on the compute nodes, obviously, that deal with platform operations. And so our Gen 1 implementation of this was to basically use what Keycloak calls a service account which is effectively just issuing a long-running OIDC token and handing it out, right? And it was a horrible implementation. I'm still maybe a little bit embarrassed by it at the end of the day, but we had to get started somewhere. Um, and we knew that we were gonna have to build something specifically to accommodate this. Uh, and as it turned out, um, Cytel and Cray were acquired around roughly the same time. And I started interacting with uh, Sunil and Emiliano and it became pretty clear pretty quickly that while we were pretty, we were very familiar with Spiffy because of our use of Istio, we hadn't really considered Spire. It wasn't on our radar screens. And after a little bit of discussion internally, um, the aha moment came and the, the dots are connected and, and we didn't have to build anything. We really just needed to pick up the ball with Spire and get going. And so we did. And, uh, and it was a great collaboration. Uh, I would say that it was probably one of the, the easier implementation cycles I've been through in that whole um, process. Uh, it took less than 90 days and we were, we were up and running in the, in the system. Um, and so that included, uh, that included the whole nine yards of, of applications talking across the, uh, the API plane. So this is where we sit today um, with the Shasta CSM. As you can see, there are obviously the key cloak is there for the, uh, the individual users um, and then the MPEs are covered by Spire. Uh, today we use joint tokens. Um, to, uh, to test the uh, compute nodes, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. Um, and, uh, and then the, the SVIDs get issued and, and away we go. Uh, the applications then basically trans are issued an OIDC token from the Spire server, and they're evaluated appropriately as they come through the, uh, the API calls as they come through the gateway um, to point them at the right uh, issuing server. So. Um, so this is our world, um, and I'd say, again, it's a fairly straightforward and standard implementation in most respects um, with the addition of Spire making our live a lot, lives a lot easier. So where do we go from here? Uh, I'd say that the, uh, the state of the, of the control plane or the access control framework um, is good for a 1.0 implementation, um, but you can always improve. And, and we will seek to do that. And so the big place that we have a challenge is really that, that node attestation in the compute plane. Um, the, when, the original, uh, when the original specifications were cut for these Shasta systems, uh, TPMs were not specified on the compute blades. And so we find ourselves in an awkward position. They, are, they will be going forward, um, but we have uh, machines that are fielded that, that do not have them. And so that's, that's you know, uh, objective number one, is to get a better story than we have today with the joint token. Um, uh, and then uh, we really like the uh, work that is going on with, um, with our effort to get uh, Spire and, and Istio talking together uh, in the community. 
Um, we already have a, a central PKI issuer uh, system that runs in, behind the platform. Um, and uh, and we are in the process of basically putting an operator in place to, to roll the certs um, uh, from the issuer for Istio. It would be nicer if we could just bolt in uh, Spire to that task and call it done. Um, that would be that would be awesome. Um, the other thing that we're looking forward to is API-driven workload res registration. So as platform components come on, uh, the ability to register them automatically as opposed to manually with a uh, config file, which is what we do today, um, will be uh, replaced, and that will be a good upgrade for the en engineering teams to get up and running. Um, the other uh, topic that we're going to be looking forward to is federation. So there are certain components that we have in the platform that are not baked into the CSM software itself. So one of those would be the, uh, the fabric controller. Um, the, the slingshot software is a standalone system. It could run without CSM. But the ideal scenario is that their, their access control framework can be federated into ours, and we do that through Spire. Um, that has been uh, proposed. I don't know where they're at on that team side. But then that takes advantage of the federation capabilities in Spire, which are excellent and, and pretty straightforward to, to implement as I sit today. Um, so node attestation. Uh, <laughs> I have, the astute observer might have noticed the use of joint tokens. Joint tokens are not ideal. Um, they, uh, they require you to, to create an issuing mechanism that can be um, a little bit challenging to have reach the security level that you'd really like it to. And we knew going in that this was going to be something that wasn't going to be our ultimate end state. Um, it just is what it is. Um, so, uh, so we started work on the next, uh, the next phases of that. And we, and we know where we're going to end up, I think, in the short term or in the medium term and then in the longer term um, while, while we don't have the TPMs in place or where they're not available. So let's look at this. Um, Cole was kind enough to steal my thunder on the TPM attestation. So I'm going to skip through this one real quick because I think you will look at this diagram and see something that's very much similar to what, uh, what he had presented. It's basically the flow to do the, the, uh, the TPM-based attestation from the compute node. Um, so, uh, so again, uh, so we'll, go, we'll go past this one for now. Um, and then uh, the next up for, for us is probably going to be a move to the X519-based uh, node attestation. And so with that, um, what we end up doing is injecting a, a certificate into the uh, compute node at boot time. So recall that these are diskless machines for the most part. And so, uh, so we have a process um, where we can inject at boot in the init RD phase. And we do that with, uh, with other payload um, components today. And so this will just end up adding the X name certificate into the mix. And then we start down the process of, uh, of the, the cert verification, generate the nonce, and you go back and forth, and you end up um, with, the, uh, with the SPIFI ID issued um, using the intermediate that the Spire server holds, um, which, had, which it has acquired from our PKI as a service plant. So that's up next for us. Um, we're also looking at the, um, the ACME IP-based uh, attestation. So this is another avenue that we can take. Um, it's still not where we'd like to be with the TPM side, but while we get to this process of, of um, the best that, uh, that we can, then this is uh, something that we've, we started to look at. And I think we're watching the Step CA ACME server project. I think that's something that um, we hope gets there pretty, uh, pretty quickly, and then we'll take a, a gander at that. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's Spire in a, in a supercomputer in a nutshell. Um, we have time for questions. I want to leave a time for questions if anybody has any. Um, we appreciate the chance to share the experience that we've had. Uh, I would say again that, you know, if you, haven't, if you haven't started working with Spire, it really truly is a Swiss Army knife. And it, it becomes more and more of that um, as the plug-in universe gets bigger. So I suspect this is going to be something that plays prominently in, in, uh, in a lot of engineering, platform engineering going forward. Um, so we're excited about it, and, and we really appreciated, you know, the timing that allowed this to come into the picture for us. So, uh, so with that, I'll, t I'll take questions. All right. Fire away. Lining up. 
Have you considered other hardware-based attestation methods like uh, Ruby keys or uh, smart keys that like injecting the certificate? Uh, not really in this context. Um, the uh, e the scale that you have to kind of do that with, I would say, would be challenging. Um, yeah, I guess you got oh, tens of thousands. Yeah, yeah it, it, we. It, <laughs> it does kind of change the, 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 the fleet management problem is real in, in the large footprints with any of this type of thing. So, so we try to, we want to find the way in the short term that, that is most manageable for the system administrators and because they have a big job and these machines run a lot. So we want to keep that, that overhead low. With respect to the TPMs, have you seen other, any other ways to manage those at scale? We are we are working on some things um, internally around that uh, at HPE. It's a it's to me it's that's the that's the killer app right there. Um, historically, you know TPM operations and and when you mix them in with 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 anything related to fleet management, maintenance events, you know any of that just is brutally painful, which is why a lot of people don't do it. So um, that to me, in, in the context of, of security engineering, especially when we start to really focus on hardware up attestation, um, is going to have to be dealt with. And so when you look at some of the other things that are going on with platform certs and whatnot um, and SPDM, uh, you know, the, the need is going to come for hardware to not only be, um, for, for every component in a box to be validated and so so I suspect that this is going to come to the forefront more and more and, and, and we do have people looking at that problem internally got a couple online questions here oh I got one over there too okay can I come to you right after all right just one question this is from Richard in our virtual audience Richard asks can you speak a bit to what types of scale you've seen with Spire for large node boot events <laughs> um, I will say that uh, it's improved. Um, we we seem to uh, there. There's one scenario that um, that dings us on the boot cycle. Um, so we've 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 run up to I think probably close to I want to say eight thousand nodes at this point, give or take a little bit. Um, and so uh, one of the applications that runs in the context of our world is a heartbeat mechanism. So, um, uh, so what what happens is, is like when you run through this boot cycle, all these things start heart beating almost immediately, and it's kind of a thundering herd problem. And we see we supercomputers have thundering herd problems in a few different areas. So we end up actually with the heartbeat thing turning that off during the boot cycle. And I think we're we're meeting most of our targets with the with the boot timings today. It is a contractual requirement in the supercomputer world to boot in a certain speed. So it's a, it fixes, it's prominent in the discussion. Did that answer your question? I think it was an online question. So I believe so. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we also have a comment from Anne, uh, Anne too, who oh. I think <laughs> might know you. Tell her I said hello. Yes, she would like to uh, liaise with you following the talk. Oh, great. <laughs> Be good to see her. I am passing on now. Another in-person question. <clears throat> I wonder if you were incorporating Spire into the, <clears throat> to the, the user or production workloads that you're running there and how that may tie into? Not this. today. So, so a good way to think about these machines is that they're big IIS implementations. And so it's very, it, it's a, from an analogy perspective, it's just like, hey, you boot up, here's your VPC, and then workload manager software comes in and, di and dispatches applications into the compute plane for at runtime. That's not to say that we haven't had requests from uh, the customers on this for PaaS type services. I think, I think as you see more, um, if, as you see more modern approaches to, to running jobs up in the compute plane itself, you'll start to see Spire make its way in there. But we don't provide that as a service um, in the core platform. So, so this is all platform based. This is all basically think of it as behind the scenes platform operations. So I've been building on my platform and those kind of next level. This is Slurm, the batch mm -hmm. schedulers. Yeah. To run workloads on 
we've been handling this problem. This seems like a to do that. Interested in kind of seeing how together to tie this into the blank story. Yeah. Relation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there would be I'd be there I would be surprised if there wasn't interest from some of the labs community around this as well. Yeah. Um, th there's a. Uh, 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 some of the labs actually, you know, expose these machines to a lot of researchers and they come in and, and do their thing. And so um, secrets management has been one that's been a topic of discussion, um, you know, and, and we kind of said, well, all right, you know, that's, these are all viable. Um, and as we get a little bit more mature in the platform, then we can start to look at, at the PaaS topic. Um, there's also, you know, the topic of some type of, uh, of Git service so they could do GitOps up in the compute plane with, you know, whatever they're going to run. So I think that's only a matter of time before it starts to show up. But um, I think you're starting to see different approaches to workload management come in too, right? So you have singularity containers and, you know, it's it's going to change and it's, it's a modernization that's going on, I think, across the board in HPC. Any further questions in person or virtually? Going once, cool. going twice. Sold. Thank you so much, Tim. That was awesome. Oh, thank you. How cool was that?